Hi, this is your host Aftal Bharatiya and welcome to another episode of T3M or topic of this month. The topic of this month is observability and today we have with us once again Justin Hartung, Managing Partner at Carrick. Justin, it's great to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Swamnil. It's great to be here. How do you have seen the, the evolution of observability over the years? And when is I, I say evolution, we can also talk about uh, what role observability play, why we need observability, and how it has evolved because the whole landscape has changed, use cases have changed, technologies have changed. Uh, I'll start with a, a brief how I, how I think of observability because it might be different than how some other people think. And when I think of the origins of observability, it was really about understanding what went wrong for incident management. Um, think of those logs and metrics so that people could could really dive in and figure out, okay, where did something go wrong and fix it? But then uh, companies like Google and Netflix, they started to build on these microservices and they couldn't just rely on simple logs. It was hard to look at all the components. So they also started to build distributed tracing, which allowed every component to send telemetry back to a central system and then understand how are all those systems working together. And uh, then Google also, through their SRE practices, started to t- go from a reactionary, such as an incident happened, to what are the proactive measurements, the SLIs or indicators, to understand is something about to, to go south, and then intervene before it does. And these practices and these research papers that were published really led to some crafty vendors to, to rebrand the whole monitoring into observability. And they really took that from scientific um, definitions of understanding the state of a system based on its outputs or the data that it generates. So now, I think that this has really evolved beyond simply just looking at the technical systems because the same data is incredibly useful for other people in organization. Let's think about a product manager trying to figure out, are we shipping the right features and is does the changes that we make impact the user behavior and the outcomes? And so like, uh, back to an example again at Google is they wanted to find out how does latency of a search query respond to the user behavior? And they found that, that, you know, that as the search query end-to-end response time went from half a second to a quarter second, the growth of people's search started to grow exponentially. And what that meant is that people started to think of Google search as another way of thinking and just started to use it seamlessly. But as soon as it got above 250 milliseconds, then it started to drop off quite a bit. So this is a very interesting insight. And without having all that data and understanding of what does it take for the, or the user responses and how they change, and in some cases, even artificially injected latency just to see how it affected behavior. So that's kind of more broadly um, on observability. And I think where, where it's starting to go, if you could think of that same concept of latency, now companies are running thousands of experiments at one. And these observability suites are really using a lot of um, intelligence to really highlight, like, well, what are the things that are productive and what are the things that aren't productive in a way that is consumable, consumable by the, the mere mortal engineer? Excellent. And you also kind of lightly touched upon the next question that I'm going to ask, which is about uh, how has the scope of observability grown beyond the original idea? As you said, you know, that you can, you know, other teams can also leverage it. Absolutely. And I think that this is just the evolution that we're seeing that's going to continue to to grow. So if, if I think of the monitoring and, and alerting and tracing are just signals that are being used by uh, teams, well, there's other signals that are starting to be used. If you think of the practice of FinOps, of understanding, well, what are the cost basis of all the things you're running? Well, now engineers and product managers could start to also take in the cost. So not only you're looking at optimizing the outcomes for the user, but what if that outcome gives you five more dollars of profit but costs you 10 more dollars in cost? Well, maybe that's a bad decision. Without the FinOps data, you would only look at the revenue drivers, and so you wouldn't really understand the full picture. So I think we're going to continue to see this observability trend where there's more and more signals that are coming in. Um, And, I mean, call it enterprise observability or something else, but like, what is the business starting to do to to really understand how they're, they're functioning as a business and then optimize that? And I think that will expand way beyond just the technical components But think about the flow of the developer, like how many times do developers get interrupted? And so that really drives to your cost of creating software. So that's, I think, where observability is going to continue to evolve. And how much uh, uh, adoption are you seeing of observability there uh, where you're like, yeah, everybody knows that, everybody is embracing it. Or you also feel that when you talk to your own customers and clients that you have to still go and educate, hey, you don't have any observability practices in place, you need to have them. So you used a key term there, observability practices. And so too often companies think, I've got an observability tool, check the box, I'm done. But that really doesn't solve anything. And at worst, it gives you this huge bill that doesn't give you any value. It's much more of a cultural impact and a cultural changes. And companies like 
Netflix. This is just built in their DNA. So, of course, they're, they're way ahead of everyone else. But a lot of other enterprises that we work with, which is the core of our customers, helping them um, really sit with their teams and helping them develop these cloud-native practices, such as using data to drive decisions. I think that's core to that, and that's core to observability. Um, and now, contrary to what all the popular observability vendors would like you to believe, you don't actually need observability software to start developing this practice of observability. So I think, I think what I'm seeing is that there's this mixed bag of a lot of teams that have, and IT teams in particular, that have the software, but there's a lot of application developers and product managers that I run into that aren't yet using this data to make intelligent decisions, or not even intelligent, but just to help them inform their decisions. I'm so happy that you talked about the cultural aspect because uh, technology part is easy, culture part is the tricky part, and we have been seeing a lot of cultural shift, the biggest one, of course, DevOps is there, we talk about DevSecOps, we talk about the whole shift left movement, we talk about SREs, you know, all those things. From the observability perspective, um, when organizations do want to embrace this culture, the practices, what are some of the major challenges? Because tools are there, but tools themselves are not sufficient. I think there's two aspects, and I'll touch first on that cultural. I think it has to be set from leadership. So a good example is if leaders shoot the messengers when they, they show bad news based on the data, then people you know kind of implicitly get this negative feedback loop of, oh, we don't want to we don't want to understand if something bad's happening. Conversely, if leaders kind of embrace like, hey, that's an incredible insight, let's let's fix it and improve it, then that starts to create this culture of let's let's learn more. Um, and so that's that's part of of I think the the core is start with that leadership of really embracing data and using it to make decisions. Now, too often I've seen leadership use that, I'll call it lip service of saying, we need data, we need data, but they don't really have the, the same kind of data-driven decisions themselves. When they, for example, when they want to learn something about a system, they ask everyone for a bunch of custom reports that they go scramble and, and build custom reports just for that one-off inquiry, as opposed to using the systems and starting to dive in. Now, I don't expect executives like a CEO to dive into an observability tool, but it's more about how does he and nurture people at different levels to create those dashboards and use the systems for the data that they have and the data that they generate. So that's a cultural aspect. The um, uh, is one of the, the, the key elements that, that you need to start to, to foster. The next is you touched on the shift left movement. And I think this is a lot of confusion because enterprises that I run into, what they've done is they've, they've said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna get, take the developers and now we're gonna make them the operators. And we're going to make them the, you know, the, the UX and the UI. And they start adding and piling on all these job descriptions and requirements, but they don't do anything to take anything off their plate. And so I think that that's a recipe for disaster. I, um, there's a term that, that people are starting to use of platform engineering. And it's really, how do you take IT and shift it from a checkbox implemented tool to help implement in a way that can remove cognitive overload from the developers? So a good example is that if you give them the right visibility into their system, the developers, then it's easy for them to start to operate this system. But if you don't have that in, in concert, then it really starts to, to deteriorate the ability for those developers to work. And now they're spending less and less percent of their time on feature development, which is what all the split between dev and ops started in the beginning. So you really have to look at those tools and how you, you, you build platforms that allow people to consume the data in a meaningful way while you're doing that cultural change of embracing data. Can you also talk about the business value of having observability practices? Because it's more than just you know a lot of plumbing in the back, and it, it may have direct impact on, once again, businesses as well. And I'll use an analogy that is related but completely different that hopefully some business folks, if they're watching, will get. Now, before Google and online advertising, you know the joke was that 50% of your advertising is effective. You just don't know which 50%. And like, of course, companies would spend lots of money on radio, TV, and newspaper. And of course, they saw sales go up. But how would you optimize that? Well, they didn't really have a system that gave them observability of understanding the behavior of people and how it was driven based on the different things they tried. Now look at online advertising, which uh, granted is different than brand and marketing, but just this look at product advertising. Companies can know exactly how much a uh, customer is going to spend and how much profit they'll make if they click on an ad. So, of course, they're willing to spend and bid interactively on individual users because they have all the information about that user and about the products and the, the historical behavior of what they've, they've done. You could also understand this person's probably going to come back regardless, so don't bid anything for that ad because it would be a waste of money. So this is a much more sophisticated way of a business to operate. Now, at the macro um, level, companies that didn't embrace this kind of data in advertising, they kind of became outmaneuvered by competitors that were. 
And so you have a lot of these these companies. In fact, most of the companies on the the Fortune, uh, uh, excuse me, for the the um, the stock indexes are relatively young and new because they leverage this this I'll call it broader observability trend. Now, granted, they didn't call it observability at the time, but that's just an aspect of understanding how a system performs based on the metadata generated by the system. I think the same thing's happening in companies today. Those companies and enterprises in particular that aren't embracing the data that is generated by the systems to help them make data-driven decisions are going to be outmaneuvered by companies that are. And it's not a fact, are they a startup? Or it's just really simply, are they given the permission to do that from that culture as well as provided the tools that are continually evolving? And so that's the important aspect that companies need to start somewhere and just continue. It's not going to be perfect, but continually to improve both the cultural and the technological aspect. What I also want to talk about is that we all talk about generative AI uh, these days. Do you see, uh, how do you see observability uh, will benefit from uh, these uh, technologies? You really called it out is that there's nothing new about um, AI. It's been used in a lot of tools. But I have to admit, um, ChatGPT and the whole generative AI movement has really taken me by surprise. Ask me a year ago when I would have said, oh, that's science fiction, and now today it's reality. And I can't believe how impactful it is when used in the right case. Something as simple as you write, a, a, you, know, you write something and you say, hey, make it better for me, or research. Like These are incredible capabilities that are being developed rapidly. So I do think that companies in the observability space, and we're already seeing this, are leveraging the same techniques to highlight that needle in the haystack of like, well, what are the insights and the meaningful things that you need? Now, that's slightly different than the large language model that's, that is trying to generate new or like um, information out of this vast piece of information, more textual based or image based. This is much more of a search problem of understanding correlation and, cor and causation. So it's a slightly different type of AI that's being used, but it's really being leveraged quite a bit. And I think will only uh, propel uh, people to uh, understand better about the systems and, and have those insights. Uh, so that's only going to increase quite a bit. Now, the flip side of companies starting to use generative AI, I think this is a very dangerous and slip, slippery slope. And this is another area where you need observability is if you just let everyone start using AI, they're going to start going to these, these non-sanctioned systems. And before you know it, they start copying and pasting Lark likely intellectual property into these destination systems, and then information starts leaking. The problem the companies have today is they don't have any observability on who's using what. And so that's leading to this problem of an unknown uh, attack vector, will you, of, of eroding information security and intellectual property. Now, before we wrap this up, I would love to know how is Carrick helping you know customers, users in this space with, uh, as we're discussing, observability practices? Now, I mentioned observability is, is yes, the tools are, are great, but it's much more that data-driven decision-making process. At Carrick, uh, we call ourselves characters. We're quite obsessed with uh, data. It's one of our characteristics, uh, you know, that age-old saying, if, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And so every engagement we come into, we're always asking, what are we trying to accomplish and how will we know if we're successful? And if we can't answer those through data, then we haven't yet asked the right question or the right metrics or we just need to build something to build metrics. Um, and what we do is we then sit with, and that's what we really like to say, we, we, we kind of sit with our customers rather than do something for them. Because it's really about helping companies and individuals at those companies understand what questions should they be asking, what data should they be gathering, and then how they use that to make a decision. And just doing that once is nice, but it's that practice of understanding that, hey, you can ask questions and you can be wrong and you can add more data and you can improve over time. That's the, the really the, the essence of what we, we instill in teams we work with so that their capabilities continue to evolve and grow beyond our engagements. And that's core to who we are as Carrick. So I can give you an example is a company, a telecom company that we worked with. You know, they said, oh, we've got these pipelines on, on the DevOps of like who's doing what and the information when it's being pushed and how systems working. And when we, we assumed that, so we didn't include it in our statement of work, but it was pretty clear that they, they actually didn't have a system that was usable. And so we just took it on as part of like additional scope that, that, that we just built it because how would we know if we're improving and, and maybe self-serving of saying, hey, here's the impact we had. But, but the reality is it's actually pretty easy to build some of these systems so you can start using data-driven decisions. 
that particular system was just some web hooks they call out to event streaming systems into BigQuery on Google Cloud. And uh, within a month of when we pushed that, and it only took about two weeks to build it, within a month of pushing that, we were collecting about seven terabytes per month. Um, and that was allowing us to understand, well, what is the fleet of engineers, how they're functioning, where they're, they're pushing their codes, how many of those things were being successful versus rolling back. Really, how much time do you spend on rework? And now this isn't a traditional case of observability where you're looking at the microservices, but this is an aspect where you can combine it. So for example, do different engineers start to push code that causes spikes and increase in latency? Now, you don't want to use that data to punish those engineers, but you want to use that data to help engineers know who to work with to figure out how to solve these problems and really create a culture of asking the right questions. And what I um, have since, two things I thought were interesting. One is the system that was gathering those seven terabytes into dashboards that even executives could look at was costing, I think at, at when I last asked them, $500 a month. So if you think about how much it cost to in the old days of building these monitoring systems versus being able to just pump data and analyze it, it's so much cheaper. And so that's why it's part of everything we do. The second thing is that this company came back and said they, they found a breach that they would have never known about um, if it wasn't for that telemetry pipeline. And so that was a, a huge also benefit of they were able to uncover, well, what happened and when. I like to think that if we were also engaged in security, maybe that breach wouldn't have happened, but who knows? But the thing that I do take a lot of pride in is when we started working there, executives would have fired somebody if that kind of breach had happened. But what happened instead is executives, like, they started to understand what happened and when, and they started inspecting, like, oh, how can we learn and improve from this? And it was quite comical. I shouldn't say comical because it was a very serious incident. But the shift was, hey, you know what? Assume your source code now is going to be out in the public domain. So are you, are you proud of your source code or do you want to make it better? And that was a completely different approach than I think what a, an enterprise would have taken 15 or 20 years ago. And I think that's the, also the area in evolution that's happening. The competitive advantage isn't just simply the source code you have, but it's the combination of the systems you build, how they work together, your customer experience, and the products that you assemble from those components. So that's kind of what we do at Carrick is we sit with engineers in teams to help learn how to use data, but then we also work with the executives to understand how to set goals and how to reward people based on the data rather than penalize people for having something that looks bad. It's much more about that improvement rather than the absolutes. I'll give you one other story that might not be, that you can choose to use or not. But um, observability, when you, when you create a data-driven culture that people just assume like, sure, let's gather data, you can really enable different, uh, completely different use cases you didn't think were possible. And so I'll take an example from my days at Google. Um, when they started using solid state hard drives, they didn't know when they were gonna fail. And so the concern that some engineers had is that if we put these drives on all of our index servers, they're going to fail all at the same time because they have a very similar write and usage pattern. And so some engineers thought, wouldn't it be great if we track every single bit that we turn on and off on every single disk on an an in our entire fleet in real time and then move disks around the data center based on those usage patterns? So if you just think about that, tracking every single bit on every single disk that flips, you end up having exponentially larger data of logs than you do of the data that's being stored. But you know what, it took a couple engineers and they built this and they streamed all the data in so they could understand and move disks around. And what's fascinating about that is that they, they realized that solid state hard drives were much more robust than anyone thought. And then they started selling the data back and working with all the vendors to understand how to improve their disk drives because no one had this kind of real world data. So just think about when you have a culture that says, yes, we can with data, what else could you be doing as a company? Justin, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about observability. Uh, thank you so much for all those stories, uh, great insights there. And as I said, I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day. 